For the most part, fighters don't end their careers in a satisfying way. It's just the nature of the beast. Why would I stop fighting if I can still go? More commonly, fighters will compete until they're cut and the money dries up, or they sadly fade away, crushing the image we hold of them from their prime and filling our collective fan hearts with sadness. I'm in a glass case of emotion! But we're not here to talk about those losers today. This list is all about going out on a high note, a crescendo, giving the fans that one last glimpse of greatness before laying down the gloves and walking away, not with a whimper, but with a bang. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and hot off the press, Jocko Fuel is back and back with a banger. All Jocko Fuel supplements are now available for subscription purchase. So using the exclusive code MMA On Point 259, not only are you getting 20% off your subscription at originmain.com slash Jocko dash fuel, you're getting free lifetime shipping with no need to reorder once you're subscribed. Anyways, more on that later. For now though, here are 10 fighters who went out in spectacular fashion. A quick note about the absence of Habib Nurmagomedov and Henry Cejudo. Both fighters would without question make this list and rank towards the top, but because their retired status is still, let's say, in flux, we've chosen to exclude them from the list. All right, let's do this. Number 10, Takanori Gomi. A Japanese fan favorite, Takanori Gomi is a legendary figure from the days when Pride FC ruled the world. For a time considered the best lightweight in the entire sport, Gomi's run in Shudo, where he would win a record 12 straight and capture the 155-pound division's title, as well as his time in Pride, where he would be the first and only lightweight champion after winning the 2005 Grand Prix, score the fastest knockout in Pride history, and have the longest winning streak, are what we the fans will always think of when we remember the Fireball Kid. That or his awesome fights with Tetsuya Kawajiri and Nick Diaz. Takanori's UFC run unfortunately was nowhere near as memorable. Don't get me wrong, there were some highlights, namely his KO of Tyson Griffin and his fights with Mac Danzig and Isaac Valley Flag. But seeing a fighter we all love lose 9 of 13 fights, it's just a real bummer. From 2014 to 2017, Gomi would lose 6 straight, getting finished in every fight. It was more than time to call it a career, but just like a long losing streak when you're playing Call of Duty for 3 hours on a work night, you gotta finish on a win. The Fireball Kid would return to Japan where he made himself a legend for one final triumph at Rise in the 11, banging it out with Melvin Gillard for two and a half minutes before knocking him out cold. What a way to say goodbye. Number 9. Dan Hardy you newer fans may not know this, but that commentator with the mohawk was a hell of a fighter prior to his career in the booth. Dan Hardy was a mainstay of the UK fight scene before entering the UFC in October of 2008 and going on a four-fight tear that included wins over Marcus Davis and Mike Swick to earn himself a shot at the welterweight king, George St. Pierre, the first Englishman to fight for a title in the UFC. Hardy would get dominated and spend most of the fight on his back, losing all five rounds. He did win over a lot of fans as well as St. Pierre himself, though, for refusing to tap to an absolutely brutal armbar attempt. I just tried to break his arm and he got out and laughed at me. I was like, oh my God. I was like, <laughs> Dan would have a three-fight slip from there, but not without entertainment value, swinging for the fences in a KO loss to Carlos Condit and having a fight of the night with Chris Lytle. The outlaw would bounce back, KOing world-class coach and seller of peanut butter, Dwayne Ludwig. Next, Hardy would be booked in his native Nottingham, England, Nottingham, in a co-main event bout with Amir Sadala. Dan looked fantastic, utilizing a far more diverse skill set than he'd shown previously to earn himself a solid UD victory in his hometown. In hindsight, a great way to go out, showing an improved game in front of his most loyal fans. Hardy would be forced from competition due to a heart condition. He's since been medically cleared, but has not returned. Number 8. Kazuo Misaki is there any better way to go out than with a massive upset victory? Beloved Japanese fighter Kazuo Masaki had already more than made his impact on the sport when he signed up to fight Paul Daly at Strike Force Tate vs. Rousey. He had once competed for the King of Pancrase Middleweight Championship against Nate Marquardt. He of course defeated Dan Henderson on his way to winning the Pride 2006 Welterweight Grand Prix, and he went ahead and arguably had the greatest fight outside the Zufa umbrella in the sport's history when he had a rematch with George Santiago for the Sengoku Middleweight title in August of 2010. Seriously, go watch that fight it's bonkers. Masaki's career had slowed down considerably by 2012, though. He'd only competed once the year prior and decided it was time to look for a new career. Not before throwing down with Paul Daly, though. Simtex was coming off his war with Nick Diaz for the Strike Force Welterweight strap, as well as a title eliminator against Tyron Woodley. No shame in those losses at all. This fight was to be Daly's big comeback. He was an enormous betting favorite going in, and he would lose. Masaki was all over Simtex on the feet, to the surprise of everybody. He looked fantastic, forcing Daly to resort to grappling. Even though Kazuo was the clear winner, he would get a split decision victory. Despite that, the story of the night was about his career resurgence, but Masaki was satisfied leaving on a high note. 
Number seven, Chris Lytle. Guys like Chris Lytle aren't supposed to go out in glorious fashion. The man had a ton of miles on him, 48 professional fights, 12 years in the sport. He'd been in Pan Crace, the WEC, Cage Rage, several different stints in the UFC. His highest height, a runner-up position on the comeback season of The Ultimate Fighter. Despite careers like his normally fading into the regional scene before a quiet retirement, four days before his 37th birthday, he was headlining a fight night card against Dan Hardy, having won four of his last five. Things really took a turn after his loss to Matt Hughes at UFC. C68. Lytle would earn eight performance bonuses over the course of his next 11 bouts. He wasn't in the title picture, but he was a fan favorite for his blood and gut style and incredible performances, earning three fight of the nights in a row and six total before it was all said and done. Coming into the bout with Hardy, Lytle announced that regardless of the outcome, he was going to be retiring. He wanted more time with his kids. Lights Out gave one final gift to the fans. The Hardy bout was a real banger, both men getting hurt several times over the course of three rounds. Late in the third, Lytle would secure a guillotine Joke and put Hardy away, earning a submission of the night and a fight of the night bonus on his way out. Number six, Cole Conrad. What's more spectacular than to end your career with fans wanting more and wondering what might have happened had you continued? Cole Conrad, who in fact made our list of fighters who left us wanting more, was very likely going to be a top-tier heavyweight in the sport. The two-time D1 champion wrestler absolutely dominated every single fight he was in, winning seven straight in Bellator, winning their season three tournaments, and then defending his heavyweight championship, finishing his final opponent, Eric Prindle, in just a minute's time with a Kimura. At 9-0, Conrad was just coming into his abilities, but already looking like an absolute world beater. A training partner to Brock Lesnar, he was getting the high-level experience needed to become a star. Cole didn't see it that way, though. He'd just started a family, and in his eyes, there are three things needed to make money in MMA. Skills, looks, and an ability to talk trash. Solid steel and sex appeal. He knew the latter two would be a problem for him, so instead of staying in a career where he felt he was at a disadvantage, he would move into a more secure money earner, his family's dairy commodities trading business. And that was that. He vacated the title and never competed again. His exit from the sport, a commentary on how selling fights is sometimes more important than what you do in the cage. Leaving as such a dominant force, especially at heavyweight, makes me want to kick something, knowing we'll never see what he could have done at the top. Number 5. Genki Sudo there simply aren't many fighters that have ever competed in mixed martial arts quite like Genki Sudo. Everything about him was unique. Whether it was his outlandish technique and movement, or the entrances to his bouts, that elevated what it even meant to walk to the ring or cage to levels of artistic expression and entertainment value that have never been replicated and I seriously doubt ever will. The man was not just a fascination though. He was a solid fighter, with some impressive wins in the UFC, K1 Heroes, and Pan Crace. The 28-year-old was a top-tier talent for heroes when he competed against Demacia. Page on the biggest card of the year, the K1 Premium 2006 Dynamite New Year's Eve show. Taken down early, Sudo would find an opening about three minutes in and sink in a triangle choke to score the victory. Afterwards, the Neo Samurai would do something that nobody expected. He would retire right there in the ring in the prime of his career, although most were unaware he was suffering from an accumulation of injuries as well. The crowd was stunned. Even without subtitles, you know when he makes the announcement based on the sound the audience makes. Sudo's exit from mixed martial arts was fittingly and awesomely just like his entire fight career, unexpected and unique. Genki would go on to pursue more music, acting, writing, philosophy, and politics. His message in the ring or in any other artistic form, he expressed himself the same, we are all one. Are you the coolest person in the world? Number four, Forrest Griffin. There are few fighters more universally beloved than Forrest Griffin. He poured his heart out every single time he got into the cage, from his legendary victory in the Ultimate Fighter finale all the way to the last bout of his career with Tito Ortiz at UFC 149. He was the perpetual underdog, defying the odds against Shogun Hua, and then again by winning the light heavyweight title from Rampage Jackson. He was friendly and funny outside the cage. How much do you weigh? Oh my god. Oh yeah but in it an absolute dog as he would describe himself. If you were going to beat Forrest Griffin, you were going to have to take it from him. Heading into UFC 148, the talk was not about the fight being Forrest's last, although it would end up being that way. Tito had the spotlight. He'd been inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame the day of the show. This was to be his final bout. Of course, that's not what happened, and Ortiz considers himself active still. Tito's supposed swan song, the third bout between the two competitors, would be classic Griffin. Three razor-thin rounds, Forrest getting hurt several times, but finding a way to come back. A tremendous high tempo back and forth that would earn fight of the night honors. Griffin's bizarre post-fight behavior notwithstanding, the fight was everything a fan could want from a Forrest Griffin bout. He would quietly retire less than a year later due to injuries. When Dana White says retire, you should retire. Otherwise, you will blow your knee out before your next fight. 
Thank you, guys. Number three, Dan Henderson. You don't gotta win to go out with a bang. Everybody knew that Dan Henderson had no business in a title fight against Michael Bisbee at UFC 204. He wasn't even in the top 10 and he was 46 years old. Now don't get me wrong, old man Henderson could still go. It just felt like at this point in his career, the best was well behind him. The only reason this fight even took place is because it looked good on paper. A rematch of their legendary UFC 100 confrontation. The last time Henderson had held or even fought for a title was in Strike Force in 2011. Hendo's final run in the UFC had not been particularly great. There was the title fight with John Jones he earned in an all-time classic against Shogun Hua at UFC 139 that was ripped from him when UFC 151 was cancelled. Beyond that, he would lose 6 of 10, heading into the title fight with Bisping gifted to him by the UFC. But wow, did he ever prove he still had it on his way out. The fight was an absolute war. Twice Bisping was on the verge of unconsciousness due to big shots, he absolutely battered him. But the count would rally and end up scoring the UD win. The bout earned fight of the night honors, and Dan Henderson walked away from the Octagon with one last legendary final performance. Number two, Rafael Lovato Jr. If there is a short list of fighters from other organizations that fans would love to see compete against the best of the UFC, Rafael Lovato Jr. would make nearly everyone's list. The Ohio native was only the second ever American to win the World Jiu-Jitsu Championship as a black belt and holds gold medals in a whole host of top-level grappling tournaments. Starting in 2014, Lovato made the move to MMA, winning the Legacy FC title before heading over to Bellator. From there, he would win five straight bouts with four finishes, earning a shot at middleweight gold against champion Gegard Mousasi. The Dreamcatcher was coming off a title defense against Rory McDonald. This was just Lovato's 10th professional bout, and he would be competing against one of the best middleweights of this generation. The champion was a massive favorite, closing at minus 515. Rafael would have early success, but the champion would rally, particularly in the fourth when Lovato had gassed. Junior would control the fifth, however, and two of three judges would score it for him. The other called it a draw, giving Rafael a narrow but impressive as hell majority decision. Masasi's only Bellator loss, his first in nearly four years. Sadly, at the peak of his career, he would be forced to vacate the title and retire due to a brain condition. And while he's still hopeful he might fight again, no doctor has cleared him for competition. Bummer. Number one, George St. Pierre. Had George St. Pierre never come back from his career hiatus, following the final defense of his welterweight title against Johnny Hendricks at UFC 167, he still would have easily made this list. The greatest welterweight of all time would hold off nine top-tier talents over the course of his five-year second reign. He had no reason to come back to the sport. His legacy was already entirely cemented. And yet, after four years away from the game, GSP would return, at middleweight no less, to compete against Michael Bisping for the division's title. This was a risky venture. Michael Bisping was a crafty, and dangerous talent, he'd been active, in fact having the greatest run of his career. While a loss wouldn't completely destroy his legacy, coming back after all that time and losing, possibly in devastating fashion, just as the Count had taken the title from Luke Rockhold, it would have been yet another sour end to a legendary career. But of course, that's not what happened. UFC 217 was a night filled with absolute magic, and it was topped off by one of the all-time feel-good moments in MMA history. St. Pierre looked phenomenal and would finish the bout in spectacular fashion, dropping Bisping and then scoring a rear naked choke to become a two-division champion. With so many of the sports legends fading slowly and sadly before retirement, GSP gave us all just a bit more of his greatness and left with more prestige than he had coming into his final bout. I just want to give a gigantic shout out to Origin and Jocko for sponsoring this video. They are always our go-to for clean energy here at MMA On Point, and I'm super excited to share their subscription offering for all Jocko Fuel supplements. If you're a diehard for their all-natural, sugar-free, keto-friendly energy drinks with no artificial colors, sweeteners, or flavors like I am, shout out to the new Afterburner Orange, you can now order these beauties by subscribing. That means by using the exclusive code MMAONPOINT259 at OriginMain.com slash Jocko-Fuel, you not only get 20% off your subscription, but you also get free lifetime shipping if you're a U.S. resident. Once you're subscribed, there's no need to reorder. You're good to go on living your best life without a hassle. Huge shout out to Max Randall for editing this video together. Follow him on Twitter at Max underscore Randall. A big, big thank you to Ben Rosette, who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page at Ben Rosette. Set. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.